Our next speaker is Dave Richards. He's the full-time technical director of the Cordage Institute. He has 39 ex years experience in the manufacturing, testing, and fabrication of rope assemblies with another 13 years of using and handling ropes. He's the author of The Splice Book. And Dave is gonna talk to us about fiber rope today and how the Cordage, Cordage Institute can help. Okay, thank you, Susan. And I would like to extend my congratulations to the organization that set this up. This is probably the nicest conference I've ever attended and it's really great. I appreciate the opportunity. This is where we are now. Oops, let me see if I can figure out how to... How do I get it to change? A slight malfunction. Sure. Okay. Okay, that's corrected. Okay, this is where we are, and this is where I'm from. <laughs> the Cordage Institute um, is a nonprofit organization, and uh, it's an organization of rope manufacturers, fiber manufacturers, um, engineers, consultants equipment manufacturers that make the equipment to make the rope and as well as um, the government representatives and our we have two committees the executive committee which is a board of directors presidents of the various rope manufacturers and representatives from the fiber manu suppliers and the technical committee and that's where all the work gets done we have um, the technical director which is myself and uh, I'm the only paid employee, so that everything falls down on, goes downhill on that bottom. We have a technical committee chairperson is elected for a two-year term. A lot of subcommittees, work groups. But the main thing is we're an all-volunteer consensus organization, which means it takes a long time to get anything done. Technical committee meets three times a year. Our purpose is to prom promote quality products, generate standards for the industri industry use, generate guidelines, and test methods. And we're also um, available for questions, and our meetings are open to anybody. Um, doesn't cost anything to attend. We, we meet two times a year in Philadelphia. And then the annual meeting is in different locations. Last year, it was, this past May, it was in Savannah, and the next one, I think, is going to be in Arizona. Right now, we have about 29 standards approved, and there are a few new ones in work in process, guidelines, publications. And um, everything has a five-year review, which means every five years, we go back over it chew it up and see if there's anything different in the taste. And then uh, right now we're in the process of revising the technical information and application manual. It's only about 17 chapters and uh, that kind of falls on my shoulders and I've got other things kind of ahead of it so we're a little slow on that one. If you're interested, we have a website, ropecord.com. We have a quarterly newsletter that's available free of charge if you get it in a PDF format. And if you have any questions or comments or anything, uh, you can contact me. I live in Sugarland, Texas. It's the sweetest place in the land. 
Uh, you can email me or you can telephone the number that's up there. That's my cell phone and I have a day job uh, because they won't pay me enough to do it full time. Um, as I manage a testing facility, we break rope, we test rope for cyclic fatigue, chain cable, anything that I can break that's under 800,000 pounds, we will do it. And um, so if I, if I answer the phone and cut you off abruptly, it's because we're in the middle of a break or something. Uh, the Institute was founded in 1920, and the reason I'm giving you all this background is because we want to be available as a source for you if you have questions. And as we get further into this, you'll see the complexity of ropes and what we're facing. And we kind of need your guidance in helping us to focus and get the information out that uh, will be of assistance to you. Um, I have a son that's in the police department. He's got about 27 years at the Houston Police Department. And I've been involved in several cases. Um, even testified in a murder case uh, a while back. But um, this is a, it's not a work of, uh, it's not hard work. It's a labor of love to be able to work with you people and help you because the more we can get this information together, I think it'll benefit you. In 1920, we started out, the court against, I wasn't here then, but they, uh, <laughs> My grandchildren think I was. Yeah. <laughs> um, they, um, they originally started the institute to control the import of manila fiber coming in from the Philippines and control the pricing. If we did what we were founded to do, we'd all be put in jail now, so we changed. <laughs> in the 1970s, uh, from oh, I guess it's in the late 30s, early 40s, until 1970, it was more of a lobbying group to help Congress understand the, the plight of the rope industry and how we needed help and protection. In 1970s, we changed from a lobbying group to a more technical oriented. And this was due to the efforts of my predecessor, Gail Foster, who retired about five years ago at 87, I think, and that's when I took over. And after that, we have kind of put, went more into the technical side because that's my background and if I'm going to be driving they're going to go where I want to go. But we are now recognized as an international standards organization. Eurocord has uh, is similar to us in Europe except they can talk about pricing we can't. And uh, years ago, oh, well, I say years ago, it wasn't too long ago, all the countries had their own standards organization. There was a German standards, the British standards, the Japanese standards, and now all of that is coming under the ISO, which is the International Standards Organization. We don't. The Cordage Institute is, I'm a member of the ISO, I'm the U.S. representative to the, uh, the on the fiber rope side, but I don't agree with a lot of the things that they're doing and their methods of testing and their methods of determining the breaking strength, et cetera. So um, we're gradually changing their minds to kind of get more in harmony with us. And that's not an easy task either. Now, what is rope? It's a product that is formed by twisting or braiding yarns together into an essentially circular cross section which is capable of sustaining a load. When I give these talks, the first thing that comes out of most people's mouth is, how strong is that rope? Well, that's part of it. But there are a lot of other factors. <clears throat> the traditional, and by some US government regulations, anything under 2 30 seconds of an inch, and that's a 16th of an inch for the Aggies, uh, <clears throat> is considered twine. The two thirty seconds of an inch to three sixteenths of an inch is called cordage, and anything above that is rope. Now, right now, um, we're manufacturing fiber ropes up to um, about eight inches in diameter, which is twenty four inches in circumference, and with a breaking strength up to about six million pounds. So, um, there has been a lot of changes 
in the raw materials made available to manufacture ropes, and we'll get into that in a little bit. But when was rope invented? Anybody know? Who has a patent on rope? Hmm? Rope was invented when somebody needed it. <laughs> right? You have to remember that when cavemen wanted to get from one point to another, or if they wanted to restrain those that were there, they had to have rope. Well, they made their rope. They made it out of anything that they had. And um, so they were actually the first rope manufacturers. And originally, the person made the rope that he needed. Later on, he got to a point where this guy was better at making rope than he was at swinging an axe, so they let him make the rope and the other guy swung the axe, so he, then he became the rope manufacturer. The oldest pictures of rope that I have, or pictures of the oldest rope that I have, was discovered in 2005 in a cave, uh, oh, and uh, off the Red Sea, I believe. And these coils that was in this hand-made cave and closed up for a while, um, were wrapped in coils and they were all about the same length and the different sizes and breaking strengths of the rope. And the researchers today are still puzzling over the material that these ancient Egyptians used to make rope. These are pictures. The uh, larger one on the left is a three strand and it looks like it's uh, made out of papyrus reeds or Nile reeds or whatever you want to call them. They, uh, that was made in rope up to about two and a quarter inches in diameter or seven inches in circumference. Uh, the next two to the right of that are the, um, again, three strand. Then the one in the middle is a single strand but with several rope yarns wrapped, uh, twisted together. And then the others are two strand ropes. But what amazed me in looking at these pictures and realizing that the Egyptians had sailing vessels. And to sail a vessel, you have to control the sails. And to do that, ropes have to run through pulleys. And for a rope to run through the pulleys, it's gotta be uniform in size, and the pulleys are not made for just that rope. The pulleys are made so the, uh, and installed, and therefore the ropes have to be sized so that they will run through the pulleys as they're needed. And in my own mind, my theory is that someday we will find evidence that the Egyptians had mechanical rope making equipment. Because from the caveman times up until the 1700s, rope was made by hand. In early 1700s, uh, a fellow by the name of Hudart in England invented the manu equipment to manufacture rope mechanically. And that was the first rope that was made by equipment. And then as we get closer to home, the Native Americans have always possessed a vast knowledge of cordage. And in New England, uh, in the 1600s, the, the Europeans that came over, the English that came over and saw the nets and the fishing lines and the, the harpoon lines and et cetera that was being used by the American Indians by their own admission were stronger, more uniform and better product than they were bringing over from Europe. There's a, a website if you're interested in going to that. And there's two things we discuss at home, rope and children, and it's hard to say which one is the most. So anything about rope, I'd, I'd like to dig into it and find out. Now terminology, and this is getting into the point where if you get a, a cord that comes in and you start dissecting it and looking at it, and you're looking for a manufacturer or you want to talk to a manufacturer, if you can speak in his language, it makes it easier to communicate. So when the, um, the Cordage Institute has a terminology for fiber rope, it's our Cordage Institute CI-1202, and it was updated in February of 03. Terminology and definitions are important to assure clear communication and understanding. And if you're asking a manufacturer and you're trying to describe to him what you see to see if he makes that type of product or if he might have an idea where it comes from, it, if you can speak his language, he can understand. 
So these are available. Uh, you can go to our website and uh, or call the Cordage Institute uh, phone number in Philadelphia and tell them that I said you could have it. <laughs> we don't charge you for them. Uh, we want you to have these so that it makes the communication easier. And this is just kind of breaking how we list it and all that sort of thing. Now, the fibers that are used in rope construction, it started out materials of convenience. Sometimes it was veins out of plants, uh, grass, hair from horses or animals or whatever, leather cut in real thin strips and then braided or twisted together. And gradually, um, at the latter part of World War II, uh, the first man-made fiber rope was manufactured in this country. And this was at the request of an army colonel. They were getting ready for their assault on the, some cliffs over in Europe. And the weight of the rope that the army rangers would have to carry was beyond I mean, they could carry it up there, but they'd have to leave things like guns and ammunition and stuff behind. So, but this colonel had remembered, and they'd used the nylon for parachutes, they'd used it for camouflage nets. And so he contacted a company called New Bedford Ropes in Massachusetts, and they made the very first man-made fiber rope. It was a three-strand nylon. Nylon is actually a DuPont trade name. Polyamide is the generic name. Um, DuPont failed in their marketing to trademark that name, so everybody used it, except in Europe they still use polyamide. And then uh, late, that was actually developed in 1939, and later on in 1939, polyester became, which is, it looks like nylon, feels like nylon, it has less stretch and does not absorb water into it. And um, so those were the two first um, man-made fibers in synthetic rope. In 1959, I think it was 59, 56, somewhere in that area, uh, Professor Natta in Italy just developed a uh, product known as what we call polypropylene fiber. And polypropylene at that time was actually a, something that they were discarding in the refineries. And he took the, what was uh, going to be discarded and determined a, a way of making pellets out of it, melting the pellets and extruding them through a, a dye underwater, and they came out with the filaments on it. And uh, you have the monofilament, which looks like real small fishing line, had multifilament, which looks like a nylon fiber, soft and many little, looked like spider webs. And then slit film, which is they extrude it in a flat film and then they cut it and then they twist the, the paper or the film into, into yarns, rope yarns. And that rolled along for a while and then later on they uh, decided that if they use something with the, the melt and the blend, then they come out with a higher strength, which is the bicomponent polyolefin. And uh, that is used in, uh, well, there's karat rope that came from uh, Norway. There's uh, uh, band line that comes from Korea. Um, I forget all the brand names, but anyway, that's a higher strength polypropylene rope. Then, um, these are a little out of order. We jump down to the aramids and para-aramids. Uh, DuPont uh, developed the aramids in the 70s. And when I first got involved with it, it was known as Fiber B, but they changed it, they trademarked it Kevlar. And then to get around their patent, uh, Tajin, a company in um, Japan, came up with Toron and Technora, which is a para-aramid, but it gets around the DuPont patent. Basically, it's the same type of fiber, very low stretch, 
high strength, but it has certain restrictions. Rope is it's not one of its favorite occupations. Then the, uh, the one after that that came about in, um, in the 80s, I guess, or early 90s, was the ultra-high molecular weight polyethylene. We kind of abbreviated it down HMPE, which is high modulus polyethylene. And we have two manufacturers, one in Holland by the name of DSM. They make Dyneema. They also have a manufacturing facility here in North Carolina. And then Spectra, which was um, developed by uh, Allied Fibers, and then Allied sold to Honeywell, and now Honeywell owns the uh, Spectra line. This is probably has done more to revolutionize the rope industry than anything else, this particular fiber, because it has light, it's lightweight, it's as strong as wire rope, size for size, and it floats. And these are the ones that they're making six, eight million pound breaking strength ropes out of now. And then the last one is LCP or liquid crystal polyester. Um, it was originally developed by Hercelanes, and now it's uh, owned by Karare, which is a Japanese fiber manufacturer. They have a manufacturing facility in North Carolina also, and then their main plant is in Japan. So these are the fibers that majority of the ropes are made today. These are available in Cordage Institute CI 2003-2003. It was updated in November 2004, and it gives a comparative reference. It gives the melting points, um, um, resistance to ultraviolet degradation, and et cetera. But again, this one, you can get it from the Cordage Institute. Just tell Pete to send it to you. He'll, he'll send it in PDF, but tell him it didn't cost anything. And then you take all these fibers, and then the next job is to put it into a construction. In order for cordage to be used effectively, it must be made with closely packed fiber structures which retain dimensions and form over, and form over a reasonable service life. Compactness is attained by successive twisting operations. Now you looked at those, those old ancient ropes, and there's another one that I saw that's about uh, not quite as old as that. It was only about uh, a little over 2,000 years old. But I saw a short section of it, and it was made out of poppers reeds. But if you look at the end, you can see where the inner yarns or rope yarns or strands are twisted to the left and then the outer ones are twisted to the right and the rope is twisted to the right. That means you can have a three-strand rope and if you hang a weight on it, it doesn't rotate, it doesn't start un unlaying. And they were doing that three, 4,000 years ago, so we're not so smart. <laughs> now, when you get these strands, you can put them together in various configurations. You, what most people think of rope is, is a three-strand, just a spiral twisted laid rope, but the, there's an eight strand rope that is four pairs, of, four of them are twisted to the left and four of them are twisted to the right and then they're plated together, which means that there isn't a hollow center. And or you can take them and braid them together in eight, 16, 24, 32, 48 strands and but when you do that, when you braid a rope, you have a center is hollow. So you have to fill it up with something. Uh, we can get more into the, that construction later on. But um, you know, single braids, we have double braids, uh, solid braids, uh, sash cords, I don't know. Uh, some of you might remember the old double hung sash windows that uh, when you raise it up, it stopped wherever you let it go. That's because there was a counterweight hanging on a rope inside the window frame. And those were sash cords. And that weight, uh, most of in those days, they made it out of cotton. And cotton would last a while, and it would rot, and you'd hear that weight go clunk, and then you had to take the bend apart and put a new weight. Now with polyester, it'll last forever. But they don't want to use them anymore, so 
uh, they have better ways of doing things. So, uh, the basic rope constructions, this is kind of give you an idea. There are numerous ways you can put rope to, fibers together to make a rope. These are the more the uh, conventional three strand, eight strand, and double braid. If any of you are sailors, spend a lot of time uh, on a sailboat, you know, real sailors. Uh, rope is your engine. That's what controls your your sails. That's that's what makes the boat go. The sails just catch the wind, but the rope is what is your engine in that. And most of them have gone now to. Uh, if you're just a Sunday sailor, you're using a polyester, and if you're into racing where weight is a factor, then you use these high weight, high strength, low weight ropes and um, to get another ounce or two of weight removed. Even on the standing rigging now, they're using this fiber called PBO, and I can't pronounce all the letters on that, but anyway. They, um, you can't tie this and you can't braid it, but they run the fibers parallel extrude a jacket over it and then socket a fitting on each end like you would wire rope. And that holds the mast in place. But it weighs about one-fifth of what the stainless steel rods and stainless steel wire used to weigh. So that's one of the areas where it's going. Now, these are a little busy, but the three and four strand ropes, um, Size ranges that you may probably or probably would encounter is anything from 3 sixteenths to 3 quarter inch diameter. Um, and these things are readily available in Walmart, Home Depot, Lowe's. They're a general rope um, used in a lot of industries, but it, they're on a shelf in Walmart. And those are um, what I call generic or commodity ropes. Just buy them, use them, and wear them out, and replace them. But life and limb usually isn't at risk. You don't use this for mountain climbing and um, lifting heavy weights or anything of that nature. Probably the majority of the ropes that you will encounter will be these and then the diamond braid and solid braids. And what we're finding is that in this day and time, so much of the commodity ropes are being imported. They're coming from China, Taiwan, Korea, India, Pakistan, Central and South America. And they're, they're coming into this country and they're packaged very nicely and they look good, but they're not, in some cases, they are not the quality that you would expect if you uh, are looking for a rope that you're gonna use in an area and want to keep it keep it for a while. One of the things when you do your analysis of a, a fiber rope, you can't just pick one strand and identify the fibers in that strand or rope yarn and assume that the rest of them are going to be the same. A lot of the imported ropes are mixing polyester with nylon. Polyester is a little cheaper, a little heavier. It gives them the weight because the rope is bought and sold by the foot, but its price is calculated on pounds. And so you just have to kind of double check and make sure that if there's a variety of fibers in there, you can rest assured 99% of the time it's going to be an imported rope. And um, solid braid is another cord that is used a lot if some of it's imported, but there are some of them in the U.S. that are taking these solid braids and putting these high-strength fibers in the core, in the middle of it, to give it a higher strength um, for a variety of reasons, a lot less stretch. And if you come across something of that nature, you can probably pretty much be assured that it's being made by one of three companies in the United States and probably it's being made for specific applications. Um, these, these pool covers, I don't know if you, swimming pool covers, that they have a, 
mechanical device to take the cover off of it. Uh, it has to pull back evenly, and so therefore stretch is a big factor, and they use a lot of these with a, a real low stretch core, an LCP or aramid core in them. Kern mantle. Kern mantle rope is a very specific rope. Kern mantle, it's, uh, actually it's two words, kern meaning core and mantle meaning jacket. It was used, uh, developed in Europe, used in mountain climbing. We use it a lot in life uh, rescue rope, uh, rope access uh, work when they swing people on the ropes and put them under areas that you can't get to otherwise. Most of them have bright colors, uh, a variety of colors, might be three or four colors in a jacket, except if they're used by the either SWAT teams or the Army uh, or military, then they're either tan or black or sand color or olive drab. There are three types, static, dynamic, and accessory cords. Static is what is a life rescue or uh, rescue type ropes, low stretch, made out of polyester. Dynamic is made out of nylon so that if you fall and the rope is holding you, you got a little bit of stretch and shock absorbing capability. But all these things are available and the, we have um, CI 1801, 1803, and 2005, which lists the constructions and the testing procedures and everything else. But beware, because a lot of them, uh, these ropes that you'll see in Walmart or Lowe's or Home Depot, have that same kind of jacket, bright colors, multiple colors. But the problem is the inside of that, the core, as you would, is just usually paper or non-woven or anything that will fill up that void. It doesn't contribute anything to the strength. So they're good to use for what they're designed for, but the trouble is, and my argument is, that they look too much like a product that is used for a much more specific application. And there are several U.S. manufacturers uh, that make the Kern mantle here, and as well as Canada and Europe. And funny thing about this, I mean, not the funny thing, but the, these ropes are all used with knots. There's not any splicing. To splice a rope, you take the rope and bend it back over itself and then unweave it and weave it back in. It simplifies it. But these ropes are not spliceable, so that everything is a knot. And I did a, uh, it's an ongoing process, but I have been studying knot breaking strength versus rope breaking strength. And that's a whole other subject we won't get into, but it's, it's very interesting. Single braid or holly braid, hollow braid, um, again, polyolefin. Some of it's polyethylene, some of it's polypropylene, or some of it's a blend. And uh, most of these are imports now coming in from overseas. And one thing you know is that almost all of them are significantly undersized. If they say it's a half inch rope, it might measure 7 sixteenths. If they say it's a 3 h it's a lot, lot smaller. And this is a combo ropes where they take the polyester and polypropylene and blend it together and make a, a rope out of it. The polyester uh, protects it from UV degradation and gives it better abrasion and wear than the polypropylene that's in the core, which gives it a little lighter weight. And then we have the HMPE, uh, and these ropes are very, usually they're very expensive compared to the other products. Majority of them are made in the United States. We have uh, New England ropes in Massachusetts, Yale rope in Maine, uh, Puget Sound rope in, and Samson rope are both in Washington State. And uh, these are the, the really top quality, very application oriented type products. They're made for specific purposes. The chances of you coming across something like that are pretty small, even though they make it in small diameter. But I found out most of the stuff that I've been looked at, these guys don't spend much money for the rope they use. So they, they buy the cheapest or what they can get their hands on. 
there's one situation there was a, a dog leash that was used to uh, tie a weight around a body and drop it in the reservoir. And the knot that was used in that, and we'll get into the knots a little bit later, was very unusual and I studied it and studied it for a while and just pictures of it. And then I found it and it was what they call a harness knot and it's a, one of the unique knots that you can either tie with a flat web or leather strap or a round cord and it holds well. And so whoever knew what, the, whoever did that knot knew what they were doing and knew how to use it. And um, double braid, double braid polyester. These slides will be available on the website, I believe, after the, when this is finally published. There are sometimes uh, constructions and products are very limited ad applications, and you might encounter some of this and in, in if it's something that was convenient for them to pick up. For instance, oakum was used for years, which is a real soft rope, and they used it to pack around plumbing fittings before they poured the lead in there or put it in the openings in a wooden hull vessel so that it would swell up and keep the water out. And that no longer exists. It had, a, had some problems with it. And I don't even know if it's, it's not made at all now. But the last, uh, we had a fellow come to the Cordage Institute looking for information. He said there are 25,000 lawsuits against anybody they can locate that's been involved in this. I mean, these are health issues. And like I said, most of that, been, if it was rope, it was usually inexpensive rope. Now, from the time rope began, the only way a rope is of any use is if it is attached to something. You're either going to lift it, pull it, or tie it down or something, but you've got to attach the rope to it. So when rope was conceived, then man must have had to figure out how am I going to make this work. So he had to come up with a knot to hold this thing together. And knots are very interesting. You know, you can tell how bored of life I have when you see that. <laughs> but um, if you're looking for a source to try to help you identify a specific knot, the Encyclopedia of Knots uh, and Fancy Rope Work by Raul Gaumont and John Hensel are very good. Uh, another source is Ashley's Book of Knots. He has a lot in there, but his, his uh, graphics and how to tie a knot, I don't think is good as the encyclopedia. There's the Ultimate Encyclopedia of Knots and Rope Work. And that's fairly new, and that is real good because it's in different colors and they have different color strands and different color ropes and showing how they interact and in the knots. If you really want to have fun, there's a website called animatednots.com. And it's the Animated Knots by Grog. And this is unique in that it'll show the picture of the knot and then or the picture of the cord laying out and then it'll start tying the knot right there before your eyes. And you can stop it, you can go step by step by step. But he has these knots divided in categories. He has sailor's knots, he has climbing knots, he has um, arborist knots, he has different knots in different categories. So, and very often a person will tie a knot that they're used to. And some people, you know, they, they do these things on quickly or whatever, but they will go back to what they know. And sometimes a knot will kind of narrow down the field that you're looking for, or at least uh, get it in the right direction. I had one situation that I was involved in where the, the knots were just a conglomeration of half hitches and overhand knots, and it was just a, a mess. However, there was two cases. One, they knew that he was the uh, guilty one because he was identified by the two children. The other one, the child died, and he wasn't, there wasn't any positive identification. But we found out that the knots in both cases were tied identical. 
that along with the fact that he was he worked in a pesticide company and these ropes were impregnated with the chemical and it was the same chemical on both sets of knots but it was very obvious to me and as I pointed out to them that these were tied by the same person because it was the same series of just nondescript hitches and overhand knots and etc. So, knots can be a help and uh, now I want to again put this up there if you have any questions if you want any information if you have pictures that you want another set of eyes to look at feel free to contact me or email me um, it's something that I do out of the love for what I do not because I get paid for it but because I enjoy doing it and I enjoy helping you people who keep us safe on the streets. Thank you very much. Is there any questions for Dave? Oh, no, I think there's one, sorry. <laughs> Scott Steffler at McCone Associates. You mentioned a few specific uh, possibilities in your talk, but in general, if we can provide a fairly specific characterization of a rope, uh, the strands, the construction, the type of fibers used, the size, uh, does the Court Institute have information that would let us uh, trace a manufacturer generally? Um, if it's a U.S. manufacturer, we can do that pretty well. But unfortunately, so much of the imports now, and we have no control, uh, it's, and they're not very quick to bring us, give us information. So um, what we're trying to do is build some kind of, what I'm trying to do is build some kind of database, but I need help as to what we're looking for because I can get ropes from various manufacturers overseas, and, but I would need help in having somebody break them down and so we can identify it with that particular type I can tell you what size and I can tell you what kind of fiber and the twist level, but that's about as far as I can go. To answer your question, no, there isn't any one source, but we'd like to build one. Okay, thanks. Any others? Okay, thank you.